please. Yeah, I think uh, Son Sonia, are there any questions that are there already? Or? Uh, right now, there are no questions. So, uh, Leonard, I think you guys can start. Uh, like so far, no many participants are there. So, I think you can unmute yourself. And uh, I think is that okay, Robin? If they can That's ask, good. yeah. So, huh? So Everything you can start asking questions, huh? So, or put it uh, put it up in the chat box also. Sure. So we can start, huh? And if there are no questions, I can start asking questions to the participants. Yeah, that is also good <laughs> to start a conversation, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Hi, this is Sachin. Uh, this is on the. I have a question on the microecology. Uh, kind of a uh, whatever loop question or whatever. When we have an ecology, uh, um, I mean the congregation of birds or animals. What do we consider as a boundary to consider that congregation as a community? I mean, is there some kind of thumb rule? Or do we look for their interactions and their exchanges so that we say that, okay, this is a community, but not just a congregation? Um, I think this is uh, related to the community ecology, is it? Uh, is it? I'm just, I'm just wondering if it's a lot of malicious uh, content or if it is. I, I was actually referring to the recent lecture that we have on microecology by Dr. Mansi Mungi uh, yesterday or day before yesterday. So okay. I mean, this is just right a basic question. Yeah. What to call a, a congregation as a community or not? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a few thoughts on this. Um, I mean, the congregations itself can be, be uh, some of them can be at resources. So those are fairly straightforward to answer because you just need to see what are the resource dependent congregations. Um, like at water, water holes, you know, you see a lot of animals coming at, uh, f f uh, you know, fruiting ficus trees. There are a lot of birds and animals coming. And uh, so these things happen. That's a little bit easier to distinguish. I think what is not so easy sometimes to distinguish is uh, where there are behavioral associations like uh, like in mixed species flocks. Have you had uh, prickly bungles talk already? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, those are those can be a little bit tricky because those are behavioral, uh, you know, birds are moving and uh, there may be other birds also who are not really in the flock. And that will take some getting used to to figure that out. Uh, but there are ways that uh, behavior is quantified uh and that those ways are used to assess these associations uh is umesh here yet uh because he would be a very good person to answer okay uh something like this but otherwise um yeah uh essentially the congregations are part of the community um community is something that makes up a larger species pool uh but Congregations are some kind of association, behavioral or resource based uh, that brings individuals together. Sure, I mean, I'm getting your point. So, uh, understood. Thanks. Sure. sure. Uh, a little announcement, uh, everyone. Uh, Umesh is slightly having a problem with the network connections, like he's in the field, it seems. So, if he can join, then that's probably good. But if he can't join, and if there is any questions regarding his uh, topic, then uh, you can put it in the discussion forum, and then we can address them later from him directly. So, yeah, and simple um, things. I mean, we can answer. You know, we have Sonia. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, uh, Chiti is here. I'm here, and. Uh, Jobin, I think, is also there. So we, sh we should be able to do this. Hello. 
Robin, there's a question in the chat by Harini. Oh, I see. I didn't notice that. Uh, is there an every, Yeah, that's a nice question. Uh, actually, there is a, there is an interesting study by uh, Sushma Reddy. Uh, I'm just uh, putting the name there. <clears throat> Uh, don't confuse with the actress. This is an evolutionary biologist, and uh, she studies uh, Wangas in Madagascar. I think I have an example in my uh, in my slides. And uh, the common wood shrike that we have here is actually a Wanga. It sits within that, so it's um, it's probably you know evolutionarily it's moved from Madagascar and colonized uh, uh, India. So that's interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm sure that there are there are a lot more connections. It's just that we haven't uh, looked. We haven't looked carefully. No, uh, my question was more specifically because uh, uh, the entire Western Ghats and Madagascar were connected, is what I yeah. understand. Because yeah. there's something like the Palghat gap there also. Uh, so yeah. I was wondering whether the Sholakili, uh, these birds which are endemic here, uh, yeah. uh, I read somewhere that it's linked to birds in the Northeast and not... Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, that's a nice question, Harini. Uh, actually, um, the problem with that is the time scale. So it's true that the Madagascar and, uh, you know, the Western Ghats were actually, you know, they were like kind of uh, next to each other. And then uh, it drifted apart. Uh, the Indian plate just moved ahead. Uh, but the only problem is that this happened like way back, I think uh, 20 odd million years or so. Uh, that is before passerines itself evolved and came out of the the Australia, you know, Southeast Asia area. Uh, <clears throat> so that's a very long time back, unfortunately. So the connections, uh, when people look for connections between Western Ghats and uh, Madagascar, you have to look at species that are older. Birds are fairly young, fairly recent. So um, uh, there's, there was a nice uh, paper uh, on uh, the purple frogs that showed a Madagascar connection. But I, th I think there are others. There's a, there, there are some flies, uh, if I remember right, uh, which, are, which are very um, like highly specialist. And for them, south of Palghat Gap, the closest relative is in, uh, is in Madagascar. Uh, so the Palghat Gap is actually, uh, uh, you know, it's a, uh, what is that called? <clears throat> uh, it's a continental, it's like a break in the plate, which cuts across Madagascar, goes through India and into Antarctic plate. So uh, uh, in some cases, those connections show up. So it really depends on the species uh, and how far back you can you can trace that. I mean, Chiti, if you have the paper of that uh, purple frog uh, discovery, I think you could just post it. That may be interesting. Does that answer, Harini? Okay. Yes, yes, very much. I uh, shall try and search for this purple frog uh, paper. Yeah, there are two actually. The, I mean, if you want to read more about that, the first one just discovers that, oh, the pur purple frog's closest relative is from... Uh, uh, you know, Madagascar. And then they found um, um, a divergence from, you know, within the Western Ghats on the Eastern slope versus Western. And that is related to climate. So essentially the first one is a big continental rift and then there's climate. So both, you know, this is things that we talk about in biogeography, that it can be uh, physical barriers and uh, climatic barriers. So barriers are just, it depends on the species. All right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah uh, there is another question uh, in the chat box, uh, Robin, from yeah. Punras. Yeah, Punras. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's right. Uh, uh, well, I think there are two points being made in your, in your comment. One is Sholakili was one species. And then there are four species of laughing thrushes. So actually, these are two groups. There's Shulakli and there's laughing thrush. Both of them uh, across the Palghat Gap were considered to be similar. Now, what 
uh, happened was that uh, you know genetic data once we collected it we figured that they are not that similar after all and uh, then they were kind of placed in four different uh, species uh, uh, depending on the mountains and the genetic divergences uh, but most more importantly they were also so different from their relatives that they had to be kind of placed in a, a, a different genus altogether so each one is a separate example both show the same pattern yeah Conrad so Shurakili and laughing thrushes patterns are similar but they are different groups um, I have a question and actually uh, an inquisitiveness inquisitiveness towards the on uh, news which make uh, frontline related to the birds going extinct and now appearing again mm -hmm. so what i want to understand here is whether uh, do we really have data related to the bird that is extinct and then reappearing again related to genetics and other things and do they actually co correlate or almost match exactly with each other uh, of what might be happening when we think they have gone extinct. Maybe they are surviving or thriving somewhere else, which we do not know, obviously. Uh, that's how they might be coming into picture again. But what usually happens when we think they are extinct, what is happening to their community? And secondly, do they actually, uh, the, the last extinct or last record versus the new record, do they closely match each other or are there actually changes happening to, regarding genetics or behavioral or anything? Uh, this last question I didn't understand. The second, the last bit about the last record. Can you just explain uh, that a little bit? What I was trying to say is we might have a data about the last species that was recorded, maybe 1800 something or 1600 something. Okay. And now it is reappearing into 2000 something. So. <clears throat> Are they actually matching related to genetic data or oh. other behavioral or something? Yeah. I mean, I know some some part of this question is tricky because we may not have data sometimes. I agree. That's right. That's right. Yeah. No. Well, actually, uh, I think there are two kinds of processes that are there. Uh, such in one is where you think a species has gone extinct, and then there is a rediscovery, which is I think mostly what you're talking about. Like the forest owlet, that's what happened. Yeah. People thought it was extinct, and then they found it. Jordan's courser, they thought it was extinct, and then they found it again. So that is just literally like uh, it's about not having the right uh, search tools or search image or you know uh, effort. I mean, it can be multiple reasons, but um, yeah. So that that's one one way that happens, and in that process. I don't think the the genetic change uh, may have happened in that time, but having said that, there is a there's an excellent, uh, uh, fascinating example of um, um, uh, I think it's called re uh, uh, like see essentially what when when you say evolution is a random process, that means that it is so stochastic that the same events can can rarely occur exactly the same way. But uh, there was this one example of a species that had gone extinct and, uh, and a similar species was then later uh, discovered. Uh, again, I don't know, Chiti or Sonia, uh, um, if uh, you know this uh, example, it was uh, famous about two years back. Um, uh, so that's worth reading also in this extinction and um, re, um, rediscovery kind of process. It's just, it's another way of um, uh, uh, that this happens. And then there is a third one, which is that the species has gone extinct and then you want to recreate it uh, using some genetic tools. So, uh, yeah, so there's this, there's this whole uh, <clears throat> uh, spectrum of what happens. I don't know if you've heard about the recent uh, dodo and Nicobar pigeon stories. It's um, been no. Yeah. Uh, let me look. Yeah, I'll 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 just post a, a link which you can see.
Yeah, because the closest relative of the the, the Dodo is actually uh, the Nicobar region. Oh, sorry, this is behind a paywall. I'm sorry about that. Probably I can search it up another link or something. Yeah, yeah. But I got the example actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, it's a it's the it's a new story. You know, there's no reason to read just this one. Um, that there's a bunch of researchers who work on this, on this idea of um, uh, uh, you know undoing extinction kind of process. So, I I slightly did not get your point about recreation. Uh, the yeah, that's point. That's that, what is that? Is it actually yeah. physically or just simulation or something? Just, just uh, uh, so this one, the Dodo example is where humans are trying to recreate it through genetic engineering. Let's say. I think they're trying some CRISPR or some other tools to kind of bring that back. But uh, what the other example that I was talking about was the same species by chance or a similar species, um, you know, coming up again. Um, again, Chiti or uh, Sonia, if you know the example, that would be great. Uh, was it? Yeah, Did I... <laughs> really yeah. sorry, I didn't know about this, but yeah, no I problem. Know no problem. Uh -huh. Yeah, sure, thanks. But I'll I'll post this uh, Sachin. I just need to rattle my memory a little bit. Uh, yeah, Lakshmi. Uh, uh, um, yeah. Good evening, sir. Uh, this is to add on to what you were having a discussion with uh, Sachin ji. Uh, extinction can happen due to many reasons, and uh, most of the time it is usually. Uh, what I have come up uh, come across when I'm uh, searching the net or something is that the bird is, uh, has failed to establish itself in the particular uh, environment, and as uh, it struggles to survive, uh, slowly it uh, uh, you know loses the battle, and then it uh, what to say um, uh, competition to survive, and only the survive, the fittest will survive, and the rest will uh, fail. So uh, how does uh, just uh, I know it's a uh, still in an essence stage and people are just thinking of uh, bringing back Dodo or something but in the present uh, current uh, um, environmental conditions does is it viable to bring back Dodo which actually got extinct due to uh, environmental factors as such also I mean how how much any kind of recreation can happen if the whole setup is not the way it was used to be when it was actually active and alive uh, because uh, Dodo ex went extinct around 50 to 100 years back and the environment has changed so much. Uh, is it viable for that? That's the one question. One And another one is um, when the play, uh, play tectonics, due to play tectonics, Himalayas started, uh, they, they, Himalayas got created. Then how come uh, bird diversity is different in the Western Himalayas and the Eastern Himalayas? So I just wanted to understand how uh, when the whole plate moved together, and it formed the Himalayas. How come the diversity be different Western and Eastern? Yeah, I like I like this last question uh, quite a bit. So I mean, I can start there. Uh, the other one, kind of others, kind of border on philosophy. So <laughs> we'll take that later if uh, uh, that's okay. Uh, so the the thing about bird evolution and and with anything, you have to remember that basically there's something that is happening with the with the landscape and that is happening at a certain time and then on top of that something's happening with climate and vegetation okay and and these two things facilitate or impede species that live in them now uh, <clears throat> what happened is when the plate or the indian plate was moving and collided with asia we really don't know what bird species were there, but we do know that there were, I think, ostriches there because even until recently, there were, there are archeo uh, like uh, these um, uh, uh, archeological sites with these um, uh, ostrich eggs, if I remember right. And um, so there are a lot of like, let's say prehistoric kind of birds uh, that are there. In India, the remains are not well examined. Uh, because this field is very, very limited. Uh, but in South America, uh, I know people have looked at, you know, what were before passerines, uh, what were there before passerines. So passerines are very new. You know, they are the new kids on the block, literally. And they radiated very rapidly. 
So today it looks like they're everywhere uh, because the ecological opportunity exists everywhere. And um, the question is how they got to some areas. So the diversity, the idea, so I'm, I'm kind of trying to break this down a little bit. There are two points there in what you asked. How did species get somewhere? And that's my first part of the answer. It depends on, uh, you know, where they come from and when they come. So technically the passerines could not have gotten here. You know, it's not related to plate tectonics, basically. Western Ghats were formed before. Uh, Himalayas probably, uh, uh, even then, uh, some part of the Himalayas are still rising, as you know. <clears throat> uh, there are some cases of, um, uh, 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 you know, in Andes, uh, you do find species which are uh, the upper mountain species are closely related to the lower mountain. So actually, you know, uh, you can you can trace back the geology based on the evolutionary history of birds because that was very recent uh, in time. But in Himalayas, uh, there are some studies that show this with wobblers because it, uh, there's a ring and so on. There's a lot of hypothesis, but it's 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 very difficult to kind of pin that down. I haven't seen very clear articulations of that. Umesh's work uh, actually very nicely shows uh, that there is this west to east gradient in babblers um, so this can happen because of various reasons and they argue in that paper also um, so if you're looking at like tropical species or wet species diversity goes from the east to the west um, but if you're looking at dry species like arid uh, biodiversity you will find more species in the west and it will decrease as you go towards the east uh, I think I have a slide, uh, Tama, and uh, this one. There's a slide in my presentation. If you can just go back and look at that, I've shown these different uh, scenarios. So it's not that all diversity is from in one direction, from west to east. It depends on what kind of diversity. So if you look at India, species have come in from Africa. Some have come in from Southeast Asia, and so on. And that that can uh, uh, that can kind of uh, affect the diversity patterns. Uh, even can this uh, affect the endemisms? Uh, like a uh, few birds are endemic to Western Ghats, for example, or a few uh, birds are endemic to uh, Himalayan ranges, the Western side or the Eastern side. So yeah. uh, does uh, endemism also depend on this uh, uh, physiological, I mean, sorry, uh, physical, uh, uh, the geographical demarcations or that it's, it's completely different ball game? No, no. Uh, uh, what do you think? Sir, I feel that uh, due to the uh, conditions where they should find the niche to uh, speciate, they speciated and where they couldn't radiate, they were like became uh, uh, in the, um, endemic. That's what I feel. So I don't know how, yeah. how right. So where is the on. endemism fitting in? That's what I am not able to understand. So that's why I yeah. asked you. So endemism is nothing but a species that is found only in some area. Right. And not found anywhere else. What, sir? So, what makes it such exclusive thing well, when the bulk of species? It can species... be many reasons. One is that uh, the conditions changed in all the other areas and they went extinct from there. That's possible too. So, now they are endemic to this. There's There are some nice papers on uh, these paleo endemism, uh, this idea where um, people have looked at species that are so disjunctly. Uh, uh, you know, they're found in just very few little pockets and they show that these must have been, you know, all connected, but now they are kind of isolated bits. And kind, of, uh, kind of habitat fragmentation or like... Uh... Yeah, but the word habitat fragmentation is used for, uh, you know, things where humans are cutting down forests, but um, climate change uh, does that as well. Um, so... Um, no, oh, I don't think there's an anthropogenic yeah. change, you know, historic yeah. crisis. Yeah, Govind, you have a question? Uh, uh, yes, sir. On the, yeah. I have a uh, question related to endemism. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, on the topic of endemism, 
uh, Australia is a unique place for endemism. Uh, uh, unique place, right, sir? Yeah. Islands usually have uh, h- high amounts of endemic species, but Australia is like an island continent. One that, even though it's it's an uh, not connected to other land masses, it's also a very large land mass in and of itself. So it's unique in that way, right, sir? In, yeah. In terms of endemic species and uniqueness. Uh, how is that? Is that similar case with uh, South America? Like until 1.4 million years ago, South America was also an island uh, before the forming of the Isthmus of Panama. Uh, mm. How did that influence endemism and diversity in South America? Sir? Yeah, I mean uh, the question is uh, it depends on what taxa you're talking about. So you know if you uh, loop back to the first bits that we talked about. uh madagascar right and uh, someone was asking about connections with madagascar and why western ghat birds and things like that so it really depends on what taxa we are talking about so some spe- any basically you have to uh, you know think about this uh, idea agnostic to what is the species what is the location what happens is if there is isolation and time that results in uh, one extinction and the other is endemism because you're isolated so there is gen- genetic drift some some species cope with uh, new challenges and so on and some don't so which is why you have all these uh, you know these adaptations in island endemics Does that make sense? So that's a broader I, answer. Yes, sir. Like in yeah. In in South America, until like one before the forming of the Isthmus of Panama, the top predators on the on the continent of South America were birds, right, sir? One of the top predators, like the I I recall watching several uh, prehistoric programs about giant terror birds. you is that an example no i mean i don't know enough uh, enough uh, uh, you know about uh, yeah i'm not very good with this uh, I-, i wish anand was here he's a great trivia person for things like this but no i'm sorry i don't know enough about what exactly happened in south america uh, also sir how would you say australia is different from other islands i mean almost uh, most Dep- islands are high in endemic species yeah. in terms of uh, due to their n- not not being connected to other land masses but oh. since australia is an island continent how would you say it's different from other islands i i didn't say it was different i mean i think you said that it was different I, all i'm trying to say is that you have to stop thinking about um, you know these names as um, as facts and think about the concepts which is the degree of isolation uh both in space and time there's only two access to this and then it depends on what taxa uh uh yes sir uh well speaking of degrees of isolation would you say that australia size uh, reduces the degrees of uh, degree of isolation as an island sorry you like australia well then uh, uh sure sir <laughs> since it's uh, such a big uh, Since yeah. it's such a big island, uh, mm-hmm. an island continent, yeah. do you think its uh, area of isolation is reduced compared to other islands? No, I think uh, uh, you're not getting this right. Um, uh, how do I fix this? Uh, again, <laughs> um, uh, maybe I can ask uh, someone, or I can just do it myself. Let me just look for. I, I'll I'll send an example in a in a moment. Meanwhile, can we take another uh, question? Uh, sir, excuse me, sir. There is yeah. a question in the chat, uh, which actually yeah. also I wanted to ask, but Guru Piji has asked before itself. Yeah. Uh, what determines adaptability to geographical conditions among some bird lineages that enable them to disperse, spread, and speciate? while others evolve to greater specialization with regard to their habitat uh what uh what determines adaptability to geographical conditions 
among some bird lineages that enable them to disperse spread and speciate while others evolve to greater specialization with regard to their habitat yeah, that's a really good question and um i think what you're asking uh um do, do you pronou uh, pronounce it as ruse it's ruse bay yeah, yeah yeah this is a question i think uh, which is this is a research question um and people are trying to figure this out uh, quite a lot uh, a great example in the bird world is the, the white eyes um if you um again i i think i can post a paper on this it's a uh, it's called uh, uh, the great speciator. Uh, but before I post that paper, let me help. Uh, I don't remember who was asking the question about Australia, but just click on that link there and follow through with that and you'll figure the Australia answer. And uh, then the great speciator one, uh, sorry. Uh, Yeah, so uh, the question with that is, um, uh, sorry, just a second, huh? There's a really cool paper on this, uh, but I'll give you, I'll give you the, 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 this, this is a easier read than, than the paper. Basically what's happening with these birds is that the white eyes, if you've seen them, those bears, they're very small birds and um, usually uh, birds that can move a lot uh, that means that they are not isolated okay so here's a species that moves a lot uh, it can actually go across different oceanic islands but strangely they also speciate like there are so many different species on these islands so it's a real like uh, it baffles people how is it that it's moving across and yet it's speciating? And the way that works is that uh, it's about that time scale and uh, it's about distance. So uh, uh, species move, they land on an island, they are stuck there for some time and that accumulates some change until for some way, you know, dispersal event, they move, um, so they get to some other island and uh, uh, these these don't these are, they're not connected so the one that came uh, from somewhere doesn't go back there you know to create genetic connectivity uh, and because of this process basically it ends up uh, becoming different species on these different islands it's a fascinating uh, fascinating uh, study um, so there are various traits, which is uh, how species, uh, you know, uh, adapt or evolve uh, based on bill size, wing length, uh, and things like that. So people have looked at all of these and tried to answer the question that you asked. Uh, but I would honestly say that this is still being researched. Uh, why do some species show this and not some others? So, Ruzpe, if you're if you're thinking of doing a short project, that's a good one to start with. <laughs> Probably much more than one lifetime work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if I may, I mean, uh, it's not really a re uh, related to this question, but in a way it is, and this is something I have. Uh, I mean, I've just kind of thought about it uh, in vacant moments. Uh, things like behavioral traits, and I'm specifically referring to as an example something like extreme skulking mm -hmm. how did that evolve i mean is it a response because i see that you know different groups with different sizes also show the trait at the same time there are what i would consider similar size uh, or habitat species that don't show it at all mm -hmm. and it's kind of well uh, you know it's kind of well distributed among all this uh, species at the same time it's not very consistent so what is it that led to this extreme skulking yeah can i ask you a question what do you do rusbe uh, i'm curious i do a regular job i see i, I see. mean uh, uh, basically instructional design writing uh, learning content 
Okay, okay. Yeah. No, I'm curious because, uh, you know, the two questions that you asked, uh, they're very relevant um, uh, to this module that we are learning. And uh, so there, there is a, uh, you, the question you are asked is spot on, and this is actually called comparative biogeography, comparative evolutionary studies. Essentially, you take a phylogenetic tree, uh, like the one that I may have referred to in the class, and you can then look at these different traits, and you can say, let's say skulking, how many times did it evolve? Is it, is it there because it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's, um, there's an ancestral trait that just got passed on. So pretty much all the species uh, just have this trait, uh, like tails, let's say, you know, in some particular uh, organisms. Um, and some of them have lost it. So you can look at traits and you can say uh, gain and loss of traits uh, and uh, actually analyze this to answer the question that you just asked, which is how does skulking evolve and how frequently it evolves? Uh, again, a great research question. Uh, exactly the same as your previous question, which is why I asked you, I was asking, I was trying to find out, you know, where your interests lie. Uh, both of these questions uh, are usually answered in this comparative biogeography framework. And um, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. there will be no uh, straight answers on this. <laughs> but these are Thank things you, that, yeah, these are things that uh, uh, sir, are um, explored, yeah. I, sir, I would like to uh, understand more about what you had said and you had said, about the skulking as a trait. Uh, what makes uh, a few uh, behavior as a traits and not all as traits? Right? Not all behaviors are taken as traits, right? So I, sorry for that. I, I would like to understand how, because skulking is something uh, I see when I observe birds or something. Skulking is more, much more of a, for a protection basis or something. They don't, just don't want to get uh, exposed to their uh, uh, predators or something. So they are very skulky in a way. As a birder, I'm just I'm trying to understand uh, how few traits, uh, few behavior are taken as traits and few are not. What what decides how to take? Them? No, actually, it depends on the question <clears throat> that you're asking. Okay, actually, I, f first thing is that I should involve uh, uh, Sonia or Siti. Would uh, any of you like to take uh, take the question? Just please. yeah, 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 sure. Huh? Uh, Lakshmi, uh, so like. Um, uh, say, for instance, if you're asking a questions based on the like uh, similarity between two species, then there are many features, the traits, either genetical traits, either morphological traits, there are many traits. So you cannot consider all of them. So there are few features that are very relevant to distinguishing the features. So it's not like you are taking only considering one trait. So based on the questions you're asking different uh, like uh, relevant questions, then based on that, you have to take a trait. So some scientists may, like some researcher may take, say for instance, uh, uh, bird beak. Okay, so bird beak is related to the question, say for instance, uh, you have, I think, heard about the classical examples of zebra fins beak and all. So how do they evolve the big uh, size and the big shape and all, depending on the habitat situation, they wanted to check. So they took that particular uh, morphological uh, morphology as a trait. So it's not necessary that they are taking only uh, uh, like uh, the big uh, morphology as a trait. So the base on the questions, it's like uh, you have to set a uh, uh, trait, particular trait. It's not necessary. Uh, it's not like that a particular trait, we are considering only one particular trait as a standard trait. So, okay, so the, these traits and the uh, uh, um, whatever we are take, gonna take for the uh, research or something, uh, it has yes. to be general, no? it can't be, yeah. uh, it can't be so a specific. It, huh, there is no standardized, like, uh, yeah, there are some standardized, let say, for instance, uh, the I'll take the same example again. So, big length, so many standard, uh, like, research. Uh, has been focused on the big lang related to the habitat and all. So how do they evolve? So scientists might took up this because there are already foundation that has been formed on this morphology. So they might took that uh, trait as a 
uh, continuing uh, the research further, but it's not necessary that the big only is the big that are related to that particular. Uh, uh, Ma'am, but there is a difference. Uh, but there is a difference between taking beak length, tarsus length, or wings of the yes. fan or something, which is uh, yes. physical as well as which is quantifiable and which is uh, also fixed. Like if you take a bird and you can, uh, if you uh, measure it, you can measure it. It's a measurable number, ma'am. Uh, yes, length, yes, the yes. tarsi length, or whatever. But yes. uh, the, uh, skulking or uh, leaning or uh, whatever, all those uh, behavior, these, these are all yeah. not quantifiable. How can that be used in a scientific research system, ma'am? When you can't quantify yeah. something, you can't take, involve it in the research ma'am. That's, yeah. that's what skulking I Skulking behavior, like there are some behavior where you can observe, say for instance, foraging. When you say a foraging example as a behavior, then what would you include in the foraging behavior? Like, we will take the cleaning, Sally, and also so stuff. So, some researcher might consider foraging when they are searching for food as well as when they are feeding. Okay, so in the case of searching for food, some birds might use big. Say, for instance, woodpecker might use uh, to uh, this big to pick on the uh, pick on the branch of the wood. Some for instance, I'm working on babbler, so I'll take the example of babbler. They will lift up like on the ground and then they will move their uh, beak in uh, uh, picking up the leaf litter and searching for the food. So there are different types of behavior in the foraging itself. So how can you quantify if you want to check a foraging behavior? I'm not sure about the skulking because I have not uh, much experience on skulking. So I'm taking the example of foraging. Okay, how can you quantify it? So foraging, if you want to look at the foraging behavior, so how can you come to quantify? And if, if you want to check how much time one spend in foraging in a particular habitat, then the other habitat and how this can evolve depending on the uh, time scale. So for instance, in one particular habitat, one spend this uh, foraging on the, uh, like, uh, on the leaf litter. So different species might possess different uh, foraging behavior, specific foraging behavior. So for instance, some might only uh, catch like a uh, green uh, bee eater, might catch bee or insects by flying, hovering in the air and try to catch it. And that type of behavior, you have to uh, quant uh, quantify it, like uh, the type of behavior in that particular broad foraging behavior you can also quantify it so for instance in skulking behavior you can divide the type of behavior you can like separate uh, categorize into smaller subsets and that what type of uh, uh, like changes in between these species or in uh, across the time in evolutionary time also you can check if it is possible for the to look at the evolutionary time if you are looking for say for instance for 100 years separate then you have to look through the literature right but you cannot access it directly but if you are looking at a time scale that you are uh, quantifying for different habitats then you can check the uh, even in the small uh, instances uh, small what to say small scale uh, differences in the skulking behavior either the time they spend in the skulking behavior or the type of skulking behavior in the foraging behavior say for instance that i've told that there might be different uh, strategy to do the foraging behavior so birds uh, foraging behavior might be different from a large predator like uh, tiger and this thing so you can quantify on the type of behavior that are uh, performing i hope okay, i got my, i got the huh. yeah i can huh. just add to that um, actually mm -hmm. so um, uh, you know, the traits when you're adding on phylogenetic trees and things like that, um, it can be uh, a categorical variable or continuous variable. So uh, skulking behavior, something like that, you can quantify the extent of skulking that is there in a species, um, um, or you can just do presence absence of it. How you quantify behavior is another question, which is like typically in animal behavior, uh, uh, classes, but um, it is possible. It's not impossible. Every every behavior, there are ways to quantify it, but uh, you need a lot of uh, knowledge of the system first. 
So I, I think it's certainly doable. Um, whether you, if you're able to call something skulking behavior, which means that there's something in your head that you're able to say, this is skulking. Now, the way to define it as a behavior depends on your ability to break it down into certain, uh, you know, certain actions that make that behavioral pattern. Yeah? Uh, got it, sir. All right, all right. Uh, yeah, Lakshmi has put the uh, questions again for dispatiation. I guess I think again. Sorry, what's it? Huh. Uh, Lakshmi, is that uh, your question now? Uh, can there be speciation among endemic endemic birds in a major way, as in totally two different species, both physiologically and genetically? Yeah, I'm not sure about <laughs> physiological. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know. Chiti, do you want to take this? Uh, yeah, I just like put the Sholakili example, the Nilgiri Sholakili and White Belly Sholakili, they are endemic and. Uh, and they are the different physiologically, uh, I mean, uh, the way they look also completely. Yeah, physically, different. yes. Physically, yeah. morphologically, yes, they are different. Like the white bellied Sholakili has a white belly, and the Nilgiri Sholakili also has a white belly, but a lot of rufous on the flanks as well. No, but they are like different species found in different places. Ma'am, I was uh, trying to ask in the same place. Like, uh, yeah, for example, hypothetically, if we take an island or something where they have speciated, does the speciation goes to the level that one uh, one bird is completely different from the other species? Like, two different species have come up. That's what right, I like, like Darwin's finches. Yeah, that's what uh, the Darwin's finches. That was in Galapagos Island, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Is there any example of such uh, such uh, thing in India, ma'am? Oh, in India, uh, because yeah, as I, uh, I was going through the uh, uh, the tectonic plate stuff, and it was like moving together towards the Asian plate. I was just uh, uh, because uh, it happened way before. Uh, um, um, uh, what to say? Um, um, I, I just wanted to know if there is uh, such sure. kind of work. Yeah. yeah, there are. There, I'm sure there are examples. I'm not. Uh, aware of them specifically in terms of endemic species, but uh, yeah, I'm I, sure I asked are... this question because each bird uh, reacts to its environment differently. One bird can be endemic and one bird can't. Uh, might be general, more, more generalist, and they might uh, go out and explore the area and uh, uh, colonize more. And one species might be very. Sh I mean, uh, they would be very, very specialistic in their way, and they might become endemic you know? So that's why I asked in particular area, given area, not the outside of it. Like uh, even in Nilgiri Sholgiri, uh, Sholgiri is in the, it's in the Nilgiri range. You know, they, uh, I just asked if, uh, for example, um, uh, Shola Sky Islands, uh, mm -hmm. in that area itself, uh, are there two completely distinctly different uh, birds of the, which has come from the same uh, ancestor or like? Uh, uh, within the same like landscape, I am yeah. not aware of it, but probably like further studies will give us an idea of if there are any. Okay. Yeah, this, actually, uh, this... Not able to understand the question. Uh, can you clarify? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Actually, this is uh, related to the question where I asked about the Western and the Eastern Himalayas. Uh, I just wanted to know if, uh, uh, say, an uh, XYZ bird has speciated a lot. Uh, speciated a lot and uh, uh, has completely uh, come out as a different species from the one which was already there. I just wanted to ask, uh, uh, for example, in Western Himalayas, you might find A, B, C birds which have been speciated a lot, and in Eastern Himalayas, they might be just A and B. I'm just, uh, I just wanted to know how the speciation is affected by endemism, sir. That's both are correlated or something. That's what I just wanted to know. Um, what do you mean by endemism? So I feel that, as I said before, uh, it's a, it's a, uh, it's how a bird reacts to its environment and tries to settle in and tries to thrive. If it can thrive, then it and it has become endemic to that particular area and it has used the niche a lot. And if it can't uh, uh, use the niche, it has created. So the crow is also endemic because it has settled down and it is thriving. 
uh, but uh, it's uh, it's not no sir a particular environment no sir see a crow can uh, the crow is a generalist bird it can survive almost in every any situation uh, but uh, not uh, let's say babblers uh, yellow bill babblers they are um, pretty much uh, endemic to south india yeah so, so now can you refine that statement of what is endemism I'm sorry, sir. I'm I'm in a brain fog. I'm not able to. <laughs> no, no. You need to think through this because I think that once you have that clarity, I think uh, you'll be able to answer. Yeah, I understand, yourself. sir. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I understand, sir. Sure. Yeah, Govin, you have a question. Uh, uh yes, sir. Uh, I I my question uh, is related to endemism again. Like. Uh, is there any trait among a group of birds, uh, among a specific family or group of birds, which allows for greater speciation and endemism in that group? Like, say, uh, uh, birds that uh, are greater long-distance flyers, would they be, uh, would that, such a group of birds be subject to greater speciation or less speciation? Uh, yeah, this is what we were talking about earlier when Bruce Bay asked, about the white eyes. Do you, do you recollect what we were discussing? Uh, I, I, yes, sir, I, I uh, fairly do. I was wondering if there are any specific traits uh, among said birds which leads to greater uh, speciation, any specific examples? Yeah, like what, what do you think might be, you know, based on our discussions, what might be a trait? Let's, let's work through this problem. Well, uh, I think one factor might be greater uh, long distance flying abilities. Correct. Uh, birds that, that would, that what will that do? Escape. It allows the said uh, group of birds to reach different parts of the world and should they should they find a specific habitat more favorable to them they are more likely to lose their uh, their ability to fly uh, f much further because it consumes more energy and are likely to set up shop there a bit permanently right sir yeah, so govin this is a problem because i think you are thinking very much uh, in very human terms about um, you know this is i think where lakshmi also has the same problem actually about what is evolution so evolution is not about intent. It's not about a species that wants to move. So uh, if a species has the ability to move like the one that you just said, you know, long distance movement, basically that means that it will move. It won't just decide that it will stay back. You see, there's, that's this, uh, Govin, what do you do? Sorry, I have to ask again. Uh, I'm just a college student, sir. Excellent, excellent. So what you should do is actually read about how the evolutionary process um, works, okay? Um, this is not to kind of uh, say that um, you shouldn't be asking these questions. You should, but uh, there is uh, there are some critical things that are missing which need a lot more thought and training. Um, uh, and w uh, um, let me... Uh, well, no, I don't think we have enough time to uh, go through that. Uh, but uh, to summarize, um, <clears throat> if a species uh, loses a trait or gains it, that is either adaptation or, you know, uh, just a chance event. Yeah. So, but if, uh, but then the natural selection process needs to work. Uh, for that trait to kind of establish. So can I request Jitti and uh, maybe Jobin that you can uh, do the uh, uh, Darwin's Finches exercise, uh, the HHMI exercise. Have you guys done that, Jitti? No, no, no. We can, so, we can do that, yeah. So one of the things, I think that both Lakshmi's and Govin's uh, questions are kind of coming from the same kind of doubts about what is evolution. Sure. Uh, so there are two things that we should do, uh, and maybe, um, you know, you can have alternate sessions. One is the HHMI annual, uh, uh, this one yeah. exercise, and the other is the HHMI Darwin's Finches. Just do the video of the Darwin's Finches with the quiz. 
Sure. And uh, so Govind and Lakshmi, I hope uh, you can attend that exercise. And that will actually clarify, you know, basically what this needs is uh, it's a thought um, uh, experiment and a process. So you need to train your mind to think in terms of uh, evolutionary processes. Does that sound okay? Uh, yes, sir. I think uh, we are almost this thing. <laughs> Why not? Uh, one last question we will take and think uh, then we can wrap up this session. Uh, is that okay, Robin? Then... Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. So there is a question from Punraj and he wants to know like uh, the wireless line in Indonesia, Palgad, they also have similar drastic change in species. Is there any name for this line? Can you please brief about the species living there? Uh, you mean the Palgad gap? Yeah, uh, Palgad gap. Okay, okay. Yeah, the Palgad gap, I mean, it, that's a fairly big name now. Uh, it doesn't, it's not as big as Wallace line because basically Wallace line is connected to, you know, the idea, the theory of evolution itself. So that's a very big deal. Uh, Palgat Gap is a narrower, uh, uh, you know, uh, biogeographic barrier. Uh, but there was a recent paper that looked at elephant uh, genetics, and they find that elephants are also kind of, you know, they have this uh, population structure across the Palgat Gap. So it is, it is actually very, it's a very important barrier. And in the world of biogeography, Palgat Gap is today um, quite famous, actually. Yeah, not as much as Wallace line, but yeah. Ponraj, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for your reply. But uh, what are the birds living there and here and there? That means that west side of the Palgat Gap and uh, east side of the Palgat Gap. Drastic change is there, no? You told. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So there's actually a whole bunch of species that are uh, different on um, uh, on both sides of the uh, Palgat Gap. Um, uh, let me pick this up. Uh, yeah, I'm just posting a link. Uh, yeah, so yeah, Chiti's posted one and I've posted another one. Uh, the uh, the one that, I mean, I think you should just follow both both of the papers. And um, both are fairly easy to read. Uh, essentially, it tests the idea that the gap is actually important. And in the second paper, we do this across the entire community of birds. Uh, and it turns out that um, um, the Palghat gap is the most important barrier for Western Ghat birds. Uh, I think it's uh, 11 or 12 species of the 25 that we looked at. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for thanks everybody for uh, the engaging discussion today. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Thank Robin. You. Then uh, <laughs> I think yeah we can wrap up this session. I guess. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Chiti has also uh, gave another this thing link and the paper. I think everyone can look it up. So if there is another uh, further questions, then we can put it on the discussion forum, so we can address them there. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah. Then. Huh. Thank you, Bye. everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you, Sonia. Bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.